Well, good morning uh, and welcome everyone here and what I understand is a large contingent watching in Panama at Stry's Auditorium. I'm Kenneth Slowick. I'm a curator of musical instruments at the uh, National Museum of American History. And on behalf of the Smithsonian Distinguished Scholar Selection Committee, I'm pleased to welcome you to this ceremony in honor of and lecture by the winner of the 2022 Smithsonian Distinguished Scholar Award in the Sciences, Dr. Joseph Wright, who is senior scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. This honor, which was originally entitled the Mouthful Smithsonian's Secretary's Distinguished Research Lecture Award, uh, thankfully shortened, has been given 25 times since its inception in the year 2000. Nominations are made by Smithsonian peers of those nominated and must be supported by letters from outside academic adjudicators, plus by full listings of the nominee's scholarly output. The Smithsonian's Distinguished Scholar Award highlights the Smithsonian's commitment to knowledge. Knowledge derived through historical inquiry, the scientific method, rigorous analysis and peer review, and the syntheses that can result from a broad understanding of a particular culture or period. People trust the Smithsonian to care for America's treasures and to pursue and share historical, cultural, and scientific truths. Because of that trust, it's important that we uphold our founding principles and James Smithson's mandate to increase and diffuse knowledge. To further these long-standing institutional commitments, a second annual Distinguished Scholar Award was instituted in 2017, so that each year, sustained achievement at the Smithsonian in both the sciences and humanities is acknowledged. Though the pandemic has played havoc with the regular presentation of these awards, they, together with the Secretary's Research Prize and the research tent at the annual staff picnic, offer Smithsonian employees, members of Congress, and the public a chance to hear what we have been doing. And that's, uh, of course, very important. Each of these events showcases Smithsonian scholars and the new and innovative ways they are sharing knowledge with the world. The criteria for the Distinguished Scholar Award are first, outstanding and sustained achievement in research. Secondly, the long-standing commitment to the Smithsonian. This is not a gold watch, but um, I see many young faces out here uh, and hope that you're around at the institution long enough to be nominated for, for this award. And third, the ability to communicate to both a specialist and a non-specialist audience. I'd like to thank the members of the selection committee, which is comprised of previous winners of the Distinguished Scholar Award, who were active in this round's review process. And you'll see from the affiliations uh, how widely spread this net uh, covers the Smithsonian. Louise Court from Freer Sackler, David Devorkin from uh, National Air and Space Museum, Giovanni Fazio, William Foreman, uh, both from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Paula Johnson, my colleague in American history, Christine Jones, also from the Astrophysical Observatory, who has just been elected to the National Academy, Nancy Knowlton from uh, uh, natural History, Christine Mullen Kramer from the uh, National Museum of African Art, Igor Krupnik from, uh, NAS uh, from the uh, Natural History Museum, Michael Neufeld from NASM, uh, Fernando Santos Guarnera from Australia, and Tom Waters from the NASM Center for Earth and Planetary Studies. To review these nominations, I think my fellow committee members would agree, is both an enlightening and a rather humbling experience. Enlightening in that one learns, at least in a broad sense, of many research projects, some of them quite chronologically long-spanning, which illustrate the breadth and diversity of our collective mission of advancing the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And humbling, because each of the nominees is obviously an important figure in his or her field. We are honored to work beside such distinguished colleagues who, through their work, uphold the Smithsonian's deserved reputation for excellence. Before we hear Dr. Wright's presentation today, which is entitled The Global, Global Importance of Tropical Forest, Secretary Lonnie Bunch has some observations on the importance of research at the Smithsonian in these somewhat perilous times. Our 
I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here this morning because this afternoon I'll be fighting Congress over many of these same issues. So it's really nice to get the support. Um, I can't tell you how pleased I am about being here. First of all, let me thank Ken and all the people involved in helping us to get to this moment. What I've been struck by, as somebody that's been in the Smithsonian probably for 35 years, what I've been really struck by is how the Smithsonian science for generations has been one of the driving forces, not only of the Smithsonian, but of the country. I'm so proud of the work that we have done in the area of science. In fact, the phrase Smithsonian science carries real meaning when I go around the country, when I talk to members of Congress. And it's a great honor today to be able to sort of build on what we've done in the past and recognize the important work that we're continuing to do today. And for me, this is really a wonderful moment because we get a chance to come back together in person. Um, we've been really grappling with this pandemic and making it harder for us to come together, but today is very special. And it's very special because we get to honor the work we've done, building on those traditions, but also honor Dr. Wright. As many of you know, he is the senior scientist at Stry. And in many ways, he's credited with creating research programs for large-scale data collection in critical elements of forest ecology. In other words, the work he's done has been paradigm shifting for the field. When I think about all that he's been able to do, He's developed protocols to study flower and seed production that have been replicated in 14 forests across eight tropical countries. His work on the future of forests worldwide is considered everything from extreme weather to global warming to the consequence of overhunting. And all of this is really helping us understand forests in profound and important ways. In short, what Dr. Wright's work has done is he's helped us understand tropical ecosystems, their rich diversity, and the many factors that influence their health. It's a body of work that helps crystallize for the world both the practical and the academic implications of climate change. In some ways, it's exemplary of the Smithsonian at its best. In today's political environmental, in today's political environment, what we're really grappling with is people who don't revel in, don't trust, don't understand science. And in some ways, it's the Smithsonian science that people can count on. And that it's impossible to overstate the importance of this long-term government-sponsored biological research with the potential to benefit humanity. Because what Dr. Wright's work has done, it's crucial to help us not just understand and protect tropical forests, but it's really a great service to the world, and it's a great example of what is the strength of what the Smithsonian can do. The Smithsonian can create that long-term research that crosses boundaries, that is really in places that are crucially important, not just to Panama, but to the country, but to the world. For me, when I had the privilege of visioning Stry last year, I was so struck by the amazing work that Dr. Wright and his colleagues are doing. So struck how they are at the cutting edge of helping us understand why it's so crucial to grapple with climate change, why it's so crucial to have the science that you can count on, that can counter the mistakes, the, the misideas that are out there, and that in essence, the work that he and his colleagues at Stry are doing is really something as when I was in Portugal the other day, they said to me, we love what you're doing in Panama because it's taking us better in Portugal. And that notion of being able to sort of make the world better by the work we do is really part of what the Smithsonian does. For me, what I love about the Smithsonian is that it's been a reservoir of knowledge, of understanding, that people have dipped into to improve their lives. Our scholarship allows the Smithsonian to, yes, create new knowledge, but also to share that knowledge in meaningful ways that will allow people to be made better by the work we do. And after all, isn't that the greatest contribution we make? That our efforts not only allow us to, in an academic sense, change the world, but allows us in a practical sense to be a place that matters, to be a place that gives people understanding, clarity, and hope. So for me, it's a great honor 
to be secretary, to sort of continue to learn and be made better by the work of people like Dr. Wright. And Dr. Wright, it's such an honor to recognize your talent and your dedication today. We are so lucky to have you as a part of this institution. And so what I'd like to do is ask Undersecretary for Science and Research, Ellen Stofan, to join me as we present this award to Dr. Wright. If I could open the award, we'd actually give it away. You, why don't we come over here so you can get a picture? We'll stand right here. Thank you for the kind words. Um, there's some other people that should be recognized here. I'm an empirical forest ecologist, data-driven. And the data that I've been able to collect, you know, I didn't really collect it. I might have got the project started, but the data were actually collected by people like Osvaldo Calderon, Milton Garcia, Mirna Samaniego, over the last 37 years, it's been almost 40 years at the Smithsonian for me. Andres Hernandez and Omar Hernandez joined us 25 years ago. Elena Gomez joined us 25 years ago. Without them, any success that I might have had would never have happened. And they, their, their contribution should also be acknowledged today. Now that said, I'm not going to talk about that data that we collected because it's pretty esoteric stuff, and I understood I had a very general audience here today. So I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the global importance of tropical forest through my eye. For this audience, a subtitle might be, why on earth does the Smithsonian Institution have a tropical research institute? Why does STRI exist? And I've just been told by Ellen, my boss's boss, that I don't have an hour and a half to give this. I got to be done by 11. So I'm going to be cutting some things out along the way on the fly. <laughs> Outline, I'm going to have a brief introduction on tropical climatology. You can't understand anything I'm going to say unless you understand the climate. In my view, tropical forests are important because of the species that live there, the biodiversity and the species richness. And I'm going to use the carbon cycle for the second globally significant role of tropical forests. You could put the hydrological cycle in there or the nitrogen cycle, all the trace gases that are messing with our atmosphere today. Tropical forests make a huge contribution to all of those, but I've only got time brief amount of time and I'll focus on the, the carbon cycle. It's going to feel like two different talks, very disjunct. But at the end, I'm going to try to integrate it all, mix it up, put it in my own crystal ball, and speculate about the future of tropical forests. So that climatology lesson. The sun is 93. The climate begins with solar inputs. And that sun is 93 million miles away. So the solar inputs arrive as kind of a wall striking the Earth. Now, if the Earth were flat and intercepted that wall like that, the solar inputs would be the same everywhere. And I guess the climate would be the same everywhere. But the Earth is a sphere. And this has two important consequences. The path of the sun's energy through the atmosphere is shorter at the midpoint of the sphere. I'm not going to call it the equator for a, for a reason. I'm calling it the midpoint. As you go toward the poles, the path through the atmosphere is longer. Now, the atmosphere absorbs solar radiation. It reflects solar radiation. So that longer path means that less energy reaches the surface. The second property of a sphere is at that midpoint, that wall of energy hits a small area on the surface. 
that diagram in the top left shows very nicely that as you go toward the poles, that same energy is distributed over a larger area. So there's less energy because of the, the atmospheric interference, and it's spread over a larger area. So you have less, a lot less solar energy at higher latitudes away from that midpoint. Now a second property of the Earth is it's tilted. Its rotational axis is tilted 23 degrees from its orbit. So this top diagram in the top left might be the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere about de December 21st. And at that time of year, the midpoint of the sphere facing the sun is the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south. Right now, this the Earth is in the opposite position. It's come around on its tilt, and we're approaching the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere a couple of weeks in the future. And that midpoint presented to the sun will be very close to the Tropic of Cancer, 23 and a half degrees north latitude. So between those two tropics, the dashed lines here, we have very high solar inputs that are very similar and we have 31 million square kilometers of Earth's land surface where the mean annual temperature is basically the same, 25 or 26 degrees centigrade. And the seasonal variation in temperature is very low. Where I live in Panama, the mean monthly temperature is 26 C for 11 months and 27 C in April. It's always summertime. Now all this solar energy coming into the tropics has a second huge effect. It heats the surface, right? Tremendous amount of energy for plants to use in photosynthesis, but also a tremendous amount of energy to evaporate water. And that warmed up air at the surface rises. So we get this belt of clouds that circles the globe. It's between three degrees latitude wide over the oceans to 15 degrees lat latitude wide over the continents. And it's always there. It moves seasonally with the Earth going around the sun. And this next, this next animation shows the consequences for global rainfall. So in 12 seconds, one second per month, you're seeing years roll by. Note this scale at the bottom. Up here in the dark blue, we're at half an inch of rain per day on average. And notice where the dark blue occurs. It's all only in the tropics. The inset here is the extreme positions of that intertropical convergence zone. In July, in red. In January, the, the summertime in the southern hemisphere, in blue. And you can see that, that if you watch the months go by, that this rainfall is following that intertropical convergence zone. That has probably always been a property of the Earth since there was a lot of free water on the surface. We've had this sort of a rainfall pattern. So what do we have in the tropics? It's warm all year round. It's wet, but the moisture is seasonal. These conditions are perfect for growing trees. And we get this huge belt of forest that circles the globe at the tropics. This is potential vegetation before agriculture or man messed things up. Um, rule of thumb, if the annual rainfall is over two meters, the forest is evergreen. If the annual rainfall is one to two meters, the forest is deciduous. Less than a meter, it's going to be an open woodland or a savanna, a different biome. There is a huge amount of potential vegetation here that's forest. Add it all up, it adds up to 22 and a half million square kilometers, a number that means nothing to me, but it is the area of North America. All of Canada, all of the United States, including Alaska, Mexico, all of Central America, the Caribbean islands, that's how much tropical forest there once was on this planet, 15% of the Earth's surface. Now I'm going to jump right into biodiversity. I'm going to be very brief here, um, cut down what I was going to say a bit. Biodiversity is tremendous. There's about 64,000 tree species that have been described. Fully 68% of them are found in tropical forests. 
South America and Central America alone, it's over 26,000 tree species in those forests. So two thirds of tree species. For ver terrestrial vertebrates, the other truly well-studied group, it's the same. Right now it's 62% of about 34,000 described terrestrial vertebrate species inhabit tropical forests. Believe it or not, there's a lot of terrestrial vertebrates to still be described, particularly amphibians and reptiles. The rate of new discovery of new species has never been higher than it is today, and virtually all those species yet to be discovered are in the tropical forests of South America and Southeast Asia, a lesser extent in Africa. Um, so it's probably true that about two thirds of all vertebrate species are also inhabiting tropical forests. Lesser known groups, you know, we don't know for insects, we don't know for microbes, but there's no reason to suspect anything different. Now the explanations. I'm going to try to explain things. Why is it this way? And to do that, I'm going to have to get into Scott Wing's territory and show you paleo temperatures. This central graph gives you the difference between the temperature in past times and the modern temperature. It's the global mean. We've got about 200 million years here, actually 195 million years, and it's a hothouse Earth. The difference, the paleo temperature is always higher than the modern temperature throughout that 195 million years. We only go to an ice house Earth with Antarctica under, under ice in the most recent 5 million years or so. Scott, don't correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, in particular, this box is particularly interesting. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. In this box, temperatures are 8 degrees centigrade above what they are today. It's a real hothouse Earth. This is a paper that Scott was a co-author on from years ago. I like it because it shows modern temperatures and contrasts them with temperatures estimated for the Eocene. Now that huge difference in temperature, 14 degrees centigrade here, isn't equal over the whole planet. It wasn't 40 degrees centigrade in the tropics. In fact, in the tropics, it was only a couple degrees warmer than it is right now. The huge increase occurred at the poles, where the temperatures are 20 and 30 degrees above what they are now. So the global mean is 14 degrees above what it is now. So what happened? The whole world was kind of much more tropical than it is today. Oh, and there's one other critical thing in this figure, this solid red line, that's a unique event. That's an asteroid, a massive asteroid hitting the Yucatan Peninsula. The KT boundary drove 67% of species on land extinct and caused a huge change in the order of life. Before that boundary, that we had dinosaurs. This is a diagram from my, a, a, an artist's rendering from my colleague, Carlos Jaramillo. The forests were open. The canopy was almost entirely dominated by gymnosperms conifers. I won't say genera names because the genera are extinct. Flowering plants, angiosperms, were present, but only in the understory as minor elements in co-dominance with ferns in the understory of this gymnosperm, open gymnosperm dominated forest. After this event, within a few million years, we have a totally different sort of forest. It's dominated by flowering plants. The canopy is completely closed, and species diversity is, has gone up. In fact, peak species diversity, Carlos says, is right here. Peak species diversity in the tropics for plants was when the temperatures were hottest, and it's only gone down going to the modern era. So that tremendous diversity I spoke about in the tropics is, is less than it used to be. Now. I've got that same geologists and paleontologists do funny things with their time axis. So I put this rectangle on to mark that 60 million hothouse earth and that big boundary, the KT boundary here, that big asteroid impact. And what we've got is a phylogeny, a dated phylogeny of all the avian, all the extant 
orders of birds. Each one of these bifurcation points is the first appearance of a new order. All the bird orders appeared immediately after this event in the next few million years. You know, before it, there were dinosaurs. It's only after it that there are birds. Mammals are a bit older than birds. They were around before. You've got a lot of diversity happening at the higher taxonomic levels earlier, but there's a, an increase in the rate of diversification after this event. And most of the orders, all of the orders, and most of the families of mammals that are extant today were in place when we had a hothouse Earth. Angiosperms are even older. The first date isn't known. This particular paper estimated it way back there at the beginning of the Jurassic. But it has dates for the origin of every angiosperm family. There's about 400 of them, so I can't put up a diagram like this. Um, the origin dates peak within that hothouse Earth. And the second, the blue curve, is the origin of extant genera, of forms that we would recognize today. And that peaks right after this event that reordered life on Earth. So that's part of the explanation of why diversity is so high in the tropics. The diversification, the radiation occurred during a hothouse Earth after that KT event. The second part of the explanation is plate tectonics and its interface with climate. Well, this is also from a paper from Scott. Scott's a co-author on. He sent it to me last week, and it perfectly demonstrates what I wanted to show, which is when this is happening, this is 10 million years after the, the big impact, the tropics are divided up into seven different independent places separated by ocean barriers that are insurmountable to, to life. Um, Northern Australia, Southern Laurasia, India, Madagascar, Africa, South America, Southern tip of the North American continent to be. These are independent places where that radiation is taking place. So as a result, you have tremendous endemicity. If I gotta cut things down, I'll just mention Madagascar as a prime example. Over 12,000 endemic plant species known from Madagascar. It's 87% of all the plant species on Madagascar are only found in Madagascar. And this endemicity is the rule across the tropics. Each one of these seven places has its own unique endemic flora. So we have a huge diversity. So that's my second explanation. Plate tectonics and climate give us the world we have today in paleotypes. Um, this slide, I'm basically going to skip over a summary, but that global diversity that I've been talking about scales down locally. And it, how does it scale down locally? That global diversity could consist, we could have exactly the same diversity at the scale of this building in forests here in, in, in Washington and forests in Panama. They could have exactly the same diversity. We just have a high turnover from place to place. That endemicity that I've mentioned is that turnover. That's very important. But there's also a huge increase at the very local scale. So this slide contrasts all the tree species known from the mixed deciduous forest biome right here. It's 3 million square kilometers. 543 tree species. And we know every one of them. We are not going to discover a new one. There's one hectare. One hectare is about the footprint of the Natural History Museum, where botanists have identified 682 tree species right on the equator in Ecuador. That's eight orders of magnitude difference in area. Eight, 100 million fold difference in area, yet we have many more tree species. So how can this be? And this, this is where my research comes in. This is my question. How do these species coexist? I'm going to give one explanation, negative density dependence. I've got a little schematic here. No one's going to accuse me of being an artist. But there's supposed to be two species here, a pointy tree and a roundy tree. And the roundy tree is at a higher density. 
and I'm going to have a mortality event, and the mortality isn't going to fall randomly. It's going to fall on the more abundant species, the species with the higher density. So we have a negative relationship between density and survival. This is a very powerful force to maintain the rare species in the system and to allow 682 tree species to be found in a single hectare, the footprint of the Natural History Museum, 682 species. This is, now there's many biological mechanisms that can give us this. Some of them are pretty arcane, difficult to understand, but there's one that's easy to understand, and it happens to be the one we think is most important, and that's enemies. When you become abundant, your enemies become abundant your parasites, your pathogens, COVID-19, there's 8 billion of us, your predators, everything that all your enemies become abundant and they whack you back. So we get this negative depend density dependence because of the enemies of the plants. And this is one half of one slide with some of my data on it. It's a global synthesis from the Smithsonian's forest geo network of about 15 or 20 sites in the New World and the Asian tropics, and a latitudinal gradient from right on the equator at Yasuni in Ecuador, up to 48 degrees latitude in northern China. And this, this negative density dependence, it's a negative effect on survival. It's a negative effect, and it's much stronger in the tropics. Each little circle here represents a species. Each column of little circles represents a site. So that's Barrow, Colorado. Seems to be an exception, but there's 300 <laughs> points there, and they're all on top of each other, and it's, it's a neg strong negative effect. This is the, the trend line and the 95% confidence interval on it, a scientist would call it. For ecology, this is a super strong event effect. Very strong in the, at the equator less strong and even disappearing at higher latitudes. So we've got the smoking gun of what maintains this diversity. So I gave this short shrift, but I'm gonna come back to it at the end. I'm now gonna make this big disjunction. I'm gonna stop talking about species richness and start talking about the carbon cycle. And we are messing with the carbon cycle. Since the industrial revolution began, we've stuck 2,500 petagrams of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Everyone knows about that. It's a crisis, right? But what is this? What is 2,500 petagrams? These are other ways of expressing it. It works out to 10 to the 15th grams. That still doesn't help me. 10 to the 15th, what does that mean? So I'm going to convert it to Toyota Corollas. This is the most popular car in the world, 32 million sold last year. The 2023 model weighs 1.3 metric tons, uh, about one and a half short tons, or the tons that you're used to. Um, and we're going to just divide that into this big number. And we're going to find out that a single pedogram is 774 million Toyota Corollas. That's two plus for every person in this country. But we don't have just one of these pedograms. We've got 2,500 of them. So let's multiply. And we end up with a global Toyota Corolla crisis. We've got 1.9 trillion Toyota Corollas that we've got to dispose of somehow. 1.9 trillion, that's another number. It doesn't mean anything to me. What does it mean? Well, there's a recent estimate published in Nature that there are 3 trillion trees. So think about the trees. Every three trees, gets two Toyota Corollas. Think about your walk home or your walk in your neighborhood. How many Toyota Corollas are parked there permanently? These aren't moving, and there's more coming every day. My forests in Panama, where there's a lot higher density of trees than there are in the forests up here, the Toyota Corollas would be stacked on top of each other. So we have a global Toyota Corolla crisis. If that doesn't help you, divide by all the people in the world, and we have 240 Toyota Corollas each of us has to dispose of. Eight billion people, we got 240. How are you gonna get rid of your 240 Toyota Corollas? 
So where does it go? We burn it, it goes into the atmosphere. We can go all the way back to 1850 with ice, with gases trapped in ice in Antarctica. Then in 1958, we can put on the Keeling curve and direct measurements of the atmospheric CO2. And we've done an astonishing thing. It used to be 280 parts per million for tens of thousands of years, for 10,000 years pre previous to uh, 1850. It's now over 420. We've added 50%, increased the atmospheric concentration of CO2 by 50%. But what if all of that carbon dioxide we produced had gone into the atmosphere? That's the purple line. This is the same observed line. This purple line is it. all that carbon dioxide that we emitted was still in the atmosphere. A vast amount of it seems to have disappeared. Where'd it go? These numbers are temperature increases. That's been observed, 1.1 or 1.2 degrees centigrade increase in temperature since 1850. This is what would have happened if all that, at, that CO2 was still in the atmosphere. You might be familiar with a target of keeping this warming under 1.5 degrees centigrade. We're not going to make it, but that 1.5 centigrade is supposed to induce a crisis. If all this CO2 we produced was in the atmosphere, the crisis would have happened a long time ago. We'd be in, who knows where we'd be, what the climate would be doing. So where'd it go? Carbon cycle, very simple representation of the carbon cycle. Carbon moves between the atmosphere and the oceans. This is, this is chemistry and physics. It's well understood. Oceanographers and atmospheric chemists believe they have a really good handle on it. It's Simple, the atmosphere and plants. This is biology. This is incredibly complex, and we don't have a good handle on it. Plants take this CO2 out of the atmosphere, combine it with sunlight and water, and in the, in the process called photosynthesis to make sugars. And th those sugars are the basis of all life on the planet. So there's this, this carbon dioxide moving back and forth. The plants then respire and send it back. So these plants are going to play a key role in the carbon cycle. Well, where are the planet's plants? Here's a global accounting of where all the plant biomass is. And guess what? Two-thirds of it is in tropical forests. And incidentally, there's still a heck of a lot of tropical forest out there. So I predict the tropical forests will have a disproportionate effect. Now these folks did another global accounting for the global carbon budget over an 18 year period. They toted up all the fossil fuels burned and all the cement produced. This is a source. They totaled up all the area of tropical forest deforested. Deforestation is really no longer happening at higher latitudes. It's in the past and they estimate this much carbon was released from that. And this is where it went. So it went to the atmosphere. This is terrible. Went to the oceans. This is terrible. The oceans are acidifying. And it went into forests. You don't need the rest of the land surface to account for all of the carbon. The budget has to balance over 18 years. And there's the balance with about 40% going into the world's forests, most of it going into tropical forests, 20% or so going into the oceans, and the remaining 40% or so going into the atmosphere. So these forests are incredibly important. What's happening to these forests? Probably most important is regrowth. Humans have been in there mucking around. They abandoned, they abandoned a pasture that wasn't working. They extracted timber. The forests are recovering from those disturbances. There's a regrowth component. There's undoubtedly also a carbon dioxide fertilization component. Carbon, you know, the plants need it for photosynthesis. You, you're fertilizing them when you add it to the atmosphere. So that's definitely going on. There's also an expansion. Forests are expanding into what were previously too cold areas in the north. Where rainfall is increasing, they're expanding into areas that were previously too wet. There's also an expansion of the growing season at higher latitudes. Although the growing season's always been 365 days a year, 
in the tropics. So all of these things are contributing to this. And we could, I could give two talks just on that, but I won't. What's the future of this? To look at the future, we need to do what the IPCC does, Intergovernmental Panel on, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They've adopted these 11 Earth system models all the projections of the future that you'll see in an IPCC report are from these 11 models. What you see is the mean projection. This breaks down the models, land carbon sink predicted from about now until the year 2100. Now if I go back a slide, 18 years, we had about 70 petagrams of carbon being taken up in forests. That's 20 years, and it looks like that's about 70 petagrams in 20 years. So most of the models are predicting that the land carbon sink stays for 20 years, even for 40 years, go 2060. It's still about 100. The land carbon sink hasn't changed very much, but there's a bunch of models that are predicting something very different that's going to happen. The land carbon sink's essentially going to disappear. The next 80 years is going to conserve less carbon than, than the previous 18. So these models in this diagram are, are ordered by their position when they intercept the year 2100. Notice the two models with the lowest, these two, with the lowest land sink. What happens to these two? South America becomes a source, and the rest of the tropics. Southeast Asia, Africa are neutral. The tropical lands, the, the, the carbon sink in the tropics has disappeared in these models. Other models, whoa, the tropical carbon sink is going strong. Now what's it gonna be? Are we gonna have big trouble? Or, is, or are we still gonna have a land carbon sink into the future? And that brings me to synthesis. I've kind of given two different talks here paleoclimates and plate tectonics affecting global diversity, negative density dependence, maintaining local diversity, then the carbon cycle and some models of what future carbon cycle might be. I'm gonna to try to synthesize this through my eyes after 40 years, the privilege of having lived almost 40 years in the Republic of Panama. The key is diversity, that species richness. This looks like a nice quilt, but actually it's about 50 tree species, thin sections of their wood, all stained with identical dye. The colors speak to the incredible chemical diversity of, this, of these woods. But I'm interested not in the colors, I'm interested in the little white circles. That's the pipes through which water flows up the tree. This one has a lot of little pipes. This one has a few big pipes. Which one's gonna transport the most water? Well, basic physics, the amount of water going through a pipe increases with the fourth power of the diameter. So this one, even though there's very few pipes, is gonna have a whole lot more water moving through it. So this one is adapted to wet situations. This one's gonna have a lot less water going through it. It's adapted to drier situations, yet they all come from the same 50 hectare plot in Barrow, Colorado Island. They all coexisting at a very small spatial scale. In part, that's due to microsite differences. The dry one might be on a ridge top. This one might be in a valley bottom. So there's differences in hydrology, but they all coexist. And when our climate changes, say it gets drier, say it gets wetter, the forest is not going to collapse. If it gets wetter, this one's going to increase. This one's going to decrease. You're still going to have a forest. And that contrasts with all those Earth system models I showed you. They have one, two, or three plant functional types in the tropics, usually three. They have an evergreen tree, a deciduous tree, and a savanna grass. If it gets, conditions get too tough for the evergreen tree, you get a biome shift to deciduous forest. If it's too tough for the deciduous tree, you get a biome shift to savanna. But that's not what's going to happen because there's a thousand tree species out there. 
some of them pre-adapted to drier conditions, some pre-adapted to wetter conditions. Forest is still going to be there. We're still going to have the land carbon sink. Now that negative density dependence. As the climate changes, some of these species are going to benefit. Some of them are going to get rare. That negative density dependence is going to kick in and, and, and save the rare, the rare ones. As they decrease in abundance, all their enemies decrease in abundance also. And that huge penalty the abundant species pay in survival goes down. And they have this advantage that being rare has, has this advantage that keeps the rare species in the system. And it's a very strong advantage in the tropics. So as the climate changes, um, tree species presence is going to be buffered. There's not going to be a lot of local extirpation and local extinction. This negative density dependence is going to save species. They're going to persist, but be rarer. Finally, let's go back to the radiation and the paleoclimates and when all this happened. The Earth was at least four centigrade warmer for 195 million years until about five million years ago. Modern plants and animals radiated. Forest diversity in the tropics was higher when it was warmer. It's lower today. So many of these plants are pre-adapted to those conditions. My colleagues down at Stry, Klaus Winter, and Martijn Slot grow tropical trees in very controlled environments, five degrees centigrade higher than the ambient modern temperature. There's no effect on growth, or some species actually grow faster at those higher temperatures. The small increase in temperature that's projected for the tropics is not going to spell doom. It's actually might be good for many of the species that are there. Not going to be good for us. I'm going to skip this next slide because it's too much speculation. And I'll leave you with this. This is a tree that actually exists. It's not the movie Avatar. This is a tree on Barrow, Colorado Island. I invite you all to come down and visit us, and I'll show you a tree just like it. Um, and I understand there might be time for questions. Joe, from what you're suggesting, um, projects then like Agua Salud, where we're reforesting the tropics, seem to be really critical if the tropical carbon sink is going to help us get through climate change and really be a, a strong defense for the planet. These reforestation projects then seem really important. Yeah, Jefferson Hall has his smart forestry project at Agua Salud, where um, Stry was able to purchase seven square kilometers of abandoned pastures and set up reforestation experiments. And the goal is to try to speed up the regeneration of the forest, to conserve, to, to, to pull more CO2 out of the atmosphere more quickly. And it's a species selection experiment. What species, what combinations of species? Should you plant single species? Should you plant mixed species? Um, what properties should those species have? We have thousands of tree species to choose from. We're trying to figure out which ones will speed the process over the natural process. Several decades ago, Stroy pioneered the use of the crane. Could you speak to what was discovered, what new science was able to be done through that innovation. Wow. Um, yeah, I was there for that. Now my late colleague, Alan Smith, was the inspiration for it. Um, what has been discovered? Wow. So Terry Irwin at the Natural History Museum made this amazing prediction, projection of 30 million insect species in the tropics. And he gave a very nice little formula, you know, so many this factor and this factor and this factor. And one of the factors was host specificity. And another factor was turnover between the canopy and the ground. And we've been able to look at both of those from the crane. So that host specificity turns out to be much lower than Terry's guesstimate. 
reducing his estimate by a factor of five. But the turnover from the canopy to the ground turned out to be much higher, increasing his estimate by a factor of five. So <laughs> it's a neutral. A whole lot of work has been done on um, some, some things like nitrous oxide. It's a critically important greenhouse gas. And what tropical forests do to the nit nitrous oxide composition of the atmosphere is just unknown. And people were able to show at the crane, Michael Keller and others, that um, the trees absorb it. There's a lot being emitted at the soil surface, but very little of it escapes because those stomates are open and they're taking in CO2 and releasing water vapor, but they'll also take in nitrogen. So the forest is not releasing nearly as much nitrous oxide as was in all the global climate models up to that point. It amounts much less than being emitted. Not just two. I mean, there's been, those trains have been there since 1989. Uh, there's a hundred other examples I could give. No corrections, Scott. No, just a question. Um, coming across the mall this morning, the sunlight was watery and gray, and it's the smoke from forest fires in Canada, which are pretty unusual for this time of year and in that location. Um, how does fire figure into the models of the forest sink for carbon in the future? The, the models don't have much fire affecting tropical forests. That fire is being added right now to several of the models of tropical forests. Um, many people would disagree with my somewhat optimistic scenario for tropical forests. They would argue that we fragmented the forest, it's all disconnected patches now, it's vulnerable to fire in ways that it wasn't before. Um, you know, as, as this climate change sets in, there are going to be such huge disjunctions to human populations. I think a lot of what humans are doing is going to come to an end. People are going to be leaving. They're going to be heading for Europe and North America. And uh, I, I, I think climate change is not going to be the death knell of tropical forests. It's, it's recreating the conditions that promote tropical forests. Virginia. Hi, Joe. Speaking of adding things to models, when you talk about all the functional traits that we have in xylem uh, morphology in the tropics, has there been an advancement to adding that, to considering that to those models? Well, yes, they're, the models are now aiming to have four functional types, four tree species in tropical forests, and they're defining them by growth rates and photosynthetic rates and their responses to drought. There's nothing about temperature responses in any of this. So I'd say the most ambitious models are attempting to have four plant functional types represent tropical forests instead of two. It's not going to catch what's going on. And, and none of them have negative density dependence. It's just not in there. And it's just crucially important. Hi, Joe. Uh, thanks so much. This is an incredible talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, negative, to, so drought may reduce some of the species, or drier times may reduce some of the species, but they could be rescued by pathogens, for example. In western forests like California, we see an interaction, perhaps, where the stress of a drought makes them more vulnerable to, uh, to pests. In tropical forests, is there is a diversity, a buffer for that, or could that happen as well? I just, I'm sure it happens. I'm sure it happens. We had a huge dry season back in 1982-83 in Panama, and afterwards we had outbreaks of leaf-eating insects that have never been seen since. Um, so I'm sure it happens. Those outbreaks did not affect all of the species. 
some of the species were not stressed. You know, we were measuring at the cranes, we were measuring the water balance of those trees. And some of those trees, even though it didn't rain for five and a half months, instead of the normal three or four months, some of the tree species never even noticed that there was a drought. They continued, their stomates were open, their water potentials were high, they have deep roots, they're in the water table, who knows? They did not perceive the drought and they weren't affected. So yeah, diversity will help to buffer the forest against that. Um, thanks, Joe, for the presentation. Um, a lot of uh, young scientists here in the audience and um, has been, we have a lot of passion for tropical forests and been following your work. Um, what's the best advice can you give to young scientists who wants to pursue this career? Hmm. <laughs> well, I would give different advice depending on where you're from. Um, look for a job at the Smithsonian. <laughs> I would say that you're going to have to learn a lot of statistics. You're going to have to be very computer savvy, and you're going to, and if you, you, you're going to have to to make a difference. You know, there's a lot of people who have are going to have those those talents. A lot of people from North America and Europe are going to have those talents. But if you're from the tropics, you've got a huge advantage. You can know the natural history. So people who know the trees, know the animals they're studying and are able to combine it, the knowledge, comfortable with computers and a knowledge of statistics are gonna be the people who are successful. Thank you very much. That's what I mean about inspiring and humble uh, to hear a talk like that. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming and for everybody watching this, uh, either in real time or when it gets uh, posted. And uh, to tell the Smithsonian staff members here that there will shortly be a call issued for the next round of uh, nominations for the, the prize, so look for that. And, in the midst of uh, experiencing all of this scientific uh, knowledge that was demonstrated here, I'd like to also take a moment to thank our Smithsonian administrators at all levels of the staff uh, from the community of scholars for creating uh, an environment in which we can uh, uh, allow research of all kinds to go forward and uh, wish uh, Lonnie all of the luck <laughs> in his battle this afternoon. Uh, and now I'd like to invite you all to come to a reception in uh, Joe's honor. It will be in the, uh, uh, the um, room, uh, which committee or conference room uh, just out here, and our uh, event staff will help uh, marshal you there. But. It, for members of the committee, could you please just wait and uh, come up for a photo uh, as we add one member to our group? Thanks.
else. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you, you, you get closer to the speaker.